most of our brains work a lot faster than most preachers preach. Matthew 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm calling this my Presbyterian sermon because I think we as Presbyterians are the most guilty of this, 4 through 27. Let us hear God's word. Everybody there, I know it's not in your bulletin. Everybody okay? Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Let me pray for a moment. Father, I do commit this time to you, totally dependent on your Holy Spirit and a work of your grace, that the words of my mouth would minister to all of us, please. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if we're not careful, we can read these words too fast. This does not say that the day that you became a Christian, that Christ became your rock. Not what it says at all. What it says is that when you, when Jesus, Jesus says, look, when I speak, and I talk, these sayings of mine, if you do them, you will be like a man who built his house on a rock. If you don't do them, you will be like a person, a, a man or a woman who built their house on sand. He did not say him. I got a little bit of an issue on Christ, a solid rock on sand. I'll talk to you about it later. But not bad. But do you understand the difference between professing Jesus as your Lord and Savior and following his teaching? Radical difference. These verses are a combination of Jesus and James. This is what James said. All of you know this. James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. Finish it if you want to. James said, do not be hearers of the word only, but what? Doers. And we go, oh no, we're saved by grace. That's not true, beloved. I mean, of course we're saved by grace. But if you think saved by grace means that you get to li live life however you want to, Jesus has a term for that. It's called lawlessness. It's not a good term. So Jesus says, if you want to live life so that when the storms of life come, you don't fall, you are a disciple of Jesus. And you're not just a disciple by hearing him, you're a disciple by doing what he says. We've already talked about it. If you're not asking people's forgiveness when a relationship's strained, you're not listening to him. You're listening to you or whomever, but you're not listening to him. Christianity is not just an intellectual pursuit. Hang on, Presbyterians, I'm one of you. And I feel at the age of 60, I have a right to speak. We, if we're not careful, we worship intellect. Are you following me? Let me give you some examples. What do we like? Sermons. Good sermons. Now, are we going to make any changes in our life? Maybe. But boy, we sure want a good sermon. Three-point one would be nice. And one that really we like. I promise you, when I was younger in the ministry, I used to think my job was to entertain you because if I did, you were going to fire me. How far off am I? I've heard people say this all the time. You know, I don't like his sermon. It's like, what have we become? Is it like the gong show or something? It's like we, we do our thing, and then y'all either gong us or not, and we go. It's not the way it is. These sermons are supposed to meant to be meaty, and I'll get more into that in just a second. Uh, Sunday school classes where we give facts, fact after fact after fact. Or any of you give, if you are, I love you. I've done it myself. I would even tell Doug if he was here, they don't need fact after fact after fact. And they go home going, boy, wasn't that a nice history lesson? We need verses that tell us what to do how to act, how to apply God's word to those facts. Everybody following me? And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, let me, well, let me give you a couple more. 
send me to seminary for three years, and I promise you it was hard. And then these officer exams. You know, they're tough, aren't they? How many of you are officers? If these, those exams are tough. A lot harder to be here than in the Baptist church, right? But when was the last time you asked a man about his marriage or his children or his family or his business or his demeanor? Is he loving, kind, outgoing, evangelical? Be like, hey, preacher, you know, you're getting, out of, you're getting out of bounds here. But it's true. If we're not careful, we worship what we know. And I'll get to more in just a moment. In 2 Timothy 3, 7, we're told this. We're always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. What do we do with our children? What do we teach them? Just relax a minute. What, what do we love to gloat about? Our children know the what? Children's catechism, right? And we know what? The shorter catechism. And guess what else I know? I know the books of the Bible. You see where we go with this? And when we let these children and ourselves feel proud that we know facts, we miss what Jesus was saying. Jesus is saying, when I tell you to do something, are you doing it? I don't care that you can give the right answer. If any of you are parents, you know what drives you crazy. Children give you the what? Right answer. <laughs> but what? They don't do it. That's what drives us crazy. It's the same with the Lord in a sense. We hear it, but we're not doing it. I will tell you this. Step one is knowledge. I think it was Amos that said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. The Apostle Paul said, if you don't know the word like you should, then you'll be unstable because you'll be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Uh, so we do have to know, but if it stops there, we got nowhere. Do you understand that? If it stops at knowledge, you realize you're going to incur a stricter judgment? It would be better that you didn't know. But if you knew, but you didn't, I didn't mean to rhyme it, didn't do you're in trouble, serious trouble. And if you think this is hard, guess what? The, I, think, I think I understand it now. We know, we do, and then we love. I think those are progressively harder. You may not, but I do. God goes, first thing, I want you to be a good student. Second, I want you to be an obedient student. And third, I want you to love everybody, including enemies. It's hard. So it progressively gets harder. Okay, step two, putting what you know into practice, what Jesus says. Jesus said this, and they will see how smart you are and glorify your Father in heaven, right? Nobody caught that? And they will see how smart you are and glorify your Father in heaven. He didn't say that at all, did he? What did he say? And they're going to see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See how smart we are? Doesn't matter. But when that intelligence gets into practice and we start being a ray of light, of example to other people, now we're living in Jesus. Not just what we know. Okay? So... You witness by what you say and what you do. You bear fruit, uh, Jesus said. Ephesians 2 said we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. 1 John says we show Jesus that we love him by obeying his commandments. Knowledge alone only what? Puffs up. You ever ran into a proud Presbyterian? How much time do you need? Get, ask me. My name's probably on there. Boy, can we be proud. And that's what God was warning. If it's just knowledge, you're going to become a jerk. I'll just use it in day-to-day -day language. Don't do that. If it's knowledge and practice, I promise you, that practice is so hard, you don't have time to worry about what other people's faults are. You know who the most qualified people are in this world who correct others? How much have you whis uh, whittled on that own log in your eye? Anybody following me? 
If you've done a whole lot of whittling on that log in your eye, you're competent to help others. Because you know what? You won't be mean. You'll be kind. Knowledge, but as we learn and obey and we become more and more like Jesus, conformed to his image, as we please God more and more by how we live and constantly reading, let me tell you what you should do. You need to read the Bible every day and read the whole Bible once a year. And I'm not backing off that. I don't care. You say, hey, I'm, I'm a lay person. I don't do that. I don't think God wrote it for the preachers to be reading it. Who did he say to meditate on it night and day in Psalm 1? You. And let me tell you something else right quick. I know I've got time. I'll stop on time if I didn't finish the sermon. Invite me back. What did Jesus say? Call no man what? Hang on. Don't, don't let me ask you because he said that about a bunch of people. He said, call no man teacher. Now, why would he do that? Because he gave pastors and teachers for the church, right? For the equipping of the saints, the saints uh, uh, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Okay, right? You know why he said, "Call no no one teacher." Guess what you're reading when you read Calvin's Institutes. What are you reading when you read Spurgeon? What are you reading when you read Table Talk? What are you reading? You're reading Sproul's what? Meditations, right? Spro studies and does what? Well, I mean, y'all do know he doesn't write all the devotions, but he, he owns the publishing of the table talk. Do you know that God would speak to you by his Holy Spirit in a greater way than he ever spoke to R.C. Spro? And I'm not kidding you. We keep waiting on these other people to feed us. They're on a new mission at IPC. They want everybody to start reading the Bible through once a year, and they don't want any more excuses. They're not real big on sermons, devotionals. Uh, what else do we do? We watch TV, TV preachers. You know what over, everybody in the congregation had to say after all they do to seek the Lord in their intellect or in their, in their reading and studying and all of that? That over 40 years at best, they only knew half the Bible. Is that true of you? See what we've done? We've messed up. And instead of having people read the Bible, we almost made them think like the Catholic Church did, that they weren't competent to learn it on their own. Well, guess what? You're not competent to learn it on your own. Who's going to teach you? The Holy Spirit that lives in you. And believe it or not, you could read the Bible on your own. It'd be far more godly than the greatest preacher that ever lived. And I wouldn't doubt it happened. As a matter of fact, I'd be, well, I won't bet my soul. I'll bet half of what I own that preachers aren't near the front in heaven. Y'all go, well, how could you say that? I'm telling you, we're some weird guys. We're some weird fellas. But I'll tell you this. If you'll shake off the fact that you've got to have somebody to teach you, and you start meditating on that word, Dan. What are the promises there? That whatever you do will prosper. All right, let me finish this part of the sermon because I do think it's important. All right. But if we begin to live and not just know, guess what you just bought? A premium on an insurance policy. You know what that insurance is for? A hurricane or a flood against your soul. Are y'all following that at all? What did Jesus say? If you don't follow my sayings, when the floods come, what happens? You fall. But if you do listen to my sayings and the floods come, you're going to be okay. Let me cut to the chase here, and I'm going to close. I'm sweating. Are y'all hot? I don't think I'm nervous. Uh, yeah, I'm worked up. Jimmy Swagger. Um, <laughs> you know storms in life are coming, okay? I promise you they are. If you are not seeking the Lord seriously every day while the sun's shining, do you even know why I said while the sun's shining? When do you make hay? When the sun's shining, okay? If you're not taking the Lord serious every day, and you're some of these people, and I am guilty of this, so I know what I'm talking about, you wait till there is a storm, and then what do you do? Oh, Lord, I'm praying more. Oh, Lord, I'm seeking you more. Oh, Lord, I'm fasting. Guess what's probably going to happen in that storm? You're going to fall because you didn't listen to him. 
And you know what? Sometimes when you fall in the storms of life, you don't get it back. I bet you there's people in this room that can say, I'm going through something that happened 30 years ago and I'm probably going to have to take it to my grave because it doesn't look like it's going to be repaired. See, you need to weather storms, not fall, okay? And if you want to weather the storms in your life, you get dead serious about that word. And don't say, are you just saying what Jesus said? No, because what did Jesus say? You follow the will of the Father. Jesus probably quoted the Old Testament as much as he gave us new teaching. So it's the whole Bible, 66 books. Learn them. Where Jesus has fulfilled it, amen, don't worry about it. But where Jesus has not fulfilled it, practice it. Practice it. Wives, are you doing all you can to respect your husbands? Let me give you practical advice. You ready? Never say much ever to your husband that's condescending. I know he's, I know what he's like. You know what I told him after we've been five or six times in the last few years? You know what I told him? You lie to him. You tell him he's the greatest man that ever lived. And you would have never married anybody else. And how in the world did you get him? You know why? Because that motivates him. And you know why it motivates him? Because Ephesians says he needs respect. You know how dumb football players are, don't you? You, you put them in practice, they'll give you half effort. You put those cheerleaders out there, and that nut will break his neck trying to show off, right? You girls know how silly we are. You see, practical. And husbands, you love your wives as Christ loved the church. That doesn't mean a Christmas present and an anniversary present. I don't know if my wife cares or not, but I think I figured it out. You know what it is? You want your wife to be happy? It's a thousand little things. Get the door. Do something. You know what? If you want to make your wife happy, don't do what she doesn't like. My wife doesn't like me leaving without the bed. Make, make the bed. It's like God said, look, the man should do what the woman wants, and the woman should do what the man wants, and that relationship is not going to get by. It's going to thrive. And you're going to get closer and closer and closer and you're going to realize what happened in the Garden of Eden is having less and less effect on your life. But you've got to make it practical, and you've got to do something. I don't know who said it. I don't think he was a Christian, but what, what did he say? If you keep doing the same thing over and over and you expect different results, you're crazy. A lot of times we're like that as Christians. We just keep doing it over and over and over and think it'll get better. Okay? So... When the storms of life come, if you want to be ready, I don't care how old you are. I've noticed some of you are a little bit older. You get your Bible out. You find a yearly reading plan, and you read that Bible every day. And if you skip a day, I do. I, I, just, I just saw the ark. Y'all know about the creation ministry? Well, they built a life-size ark, you know, the real size. It's out there near Cincinnati. And when I was driving on the road, I didn't get to my reading that day. Well, I made it up yesterday when we got back from the trip but you're reading through that bible i've got to see that word every day i've got to have it to live i promise you i'll come back if any of you are not doing that and you start doing it somebody will notice within a week i promise you it might be your wife going boy you're a little sweeter this week or what's going on with you? Or the husband. It's, it works both ways, men and women. If you're not reading your Bible on a regular basis to read it and to apply it, you're going stale spiritually. But if you'll say, hey, I've got an hour a day. Thank you, honey. I've got an hour. I can give it a day. If you ever ask me, well, how many hours a week does the Lord want? I'd say 10. He wants two or three up here. You know what I'm talking about. Two or three here, about an hour a day at home. And you watch what happens to your life. And if you said right now, well, I do feel a little stale. I'm telling you the truth. I promise you. You get in that word. And don't you feel like, well, i got to have Dr. Sproul teach me. Or i got, what, did some of you have other favorite devotionals? You don't need them. What well, you kind of do. I don't mean throw them away. But don't feel weak because you're reading the word. Because the Holy Spirit may show you something he never showed any of these scholars. I'm ready to get word of the word. I, there's words I want to get rid of, and I'm closing. Scholar, reverend, 
There's words I don't like in the kingdom. I don't think they're true. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us we've got to be hearers and doers. And there will be storms in life. And we're going to hurt if we don't take advantage of seeking you daily. That we take you seriously long before storms come. That we're preparing in our mind as we read your word that if certain storms came, these would be the verses I would quote and live by. Thank you for your word. Father, it's our most precious possession. And I cannot imagine the psalmist saying, it took him a long time to say this, oh, how I love your law, O oh Lord. But Father, we can only imagine it was as he began to realize it was his greatest blessing in life that that word had saved him so much heartache and brought him so much blessing and joy that he had to say it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.